Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of MindShift Podcast. I'm super excited to be bringing you this episode with Brady Harden, the host of the Life After Podcast. Now I'm sitting here next to my daughter, Bree. You want to say hi, Bree? Hello. She's agreed to help me do this episode and I, I talked to her today about this because I thought, you know, this is really interesting because the episode today with Brady Harden, this is all about what I call, it's called suppressing my sexuality in order to fit in. And we're going to hear Brady's story about how he came out as a gay man in the midst of being an evangelical Christian, even as a youth pastor. He was married, has a son, and he's going to tell you an amazing story. And then the episode coming up next is with Bill Prickett, who was also a pastor. He was part of conversion therapy as a pastor of an evangelical church, and he too was suppressing his sexuality in order to fit in, and the stakes were even higher for Bill. So those are two episodes coming up. And I was talking to my daughter, Bree, because of course I've mentioned this before and I even mentioned you in this episode. Did you know that, Bree? I did not. I'm infamous. (laughs) Yeah, that's probably (laughs) true. But Hang on. (laughs) Wait a minute. Let's stop this introduction. What did you say? Hang on. I asked Bree to do this introduction with me. We'll just talk for a few minutes before we get into the chat with Brady, but I think we're probably going to come back and do an actual episode with you. Isn't that right? Yeah. Get a bit more detail. Get a bit more detail because I've mentioned this before. Brie is gay. She, yes. Wait, what? (laughs) No. (laughs) Who is that? Who is that? What now? (laughs) No, you are married to a part, your partner, Tanya. Yeah. Uh, When did you get married? Just a few months ago, really, wasn't it? Yeah. So not long, long. April. We're in September, October. We're in October now. Yeah. We're in, are we now? I don't know. I don't know. October now. This is interesting because. You grew up in the church. I was the pastor. I was an elder of the church when you were a little girl. And yet we're going to get, I think, into this more in our actual yeah. episode. This yeah. is this is just an introduction kind of thing, but setting people up for that episode coming up too. Yeah. But what are your thoughts? When I was telling you about this episode with Brady, this issue of suppressing his sexuality in order to fit into the church, what was your sort of impression? I think when it's your lifestyle and you're only leading one way and it's like people have told you this is the way and this is the life and it's like that's all you know it's like with anything you know any kind of religion any kind of beliefs any kind of whatever people say to you like you know don't be a sinner god will you know you burn in hell and they scare you to death from a little kid and then it's like well, that's the way, that's the way. And it's, it's like, the truth. you're scared then. It's just more of a fear. It's not a, you know, it just depends on how you are as a person. If you decide to put yourself and your feelings first, then you can live the right way in your own self. You know? but you have to suppress your sexuality you in order to fit it. in. You know, I officially came out when I was 17, but like, I knew since I was four. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's like, it's a lifestyle that you have to make for yourself. It's just how you go about it. Some people like this guy here, you know, he married and, you know, full on lived that life, but had to totally suppress his true feelings, which is depressing, super depressing. Yeah. And as we yeah. said before, we hit record, you know, this idea of being married can actually serve as kind of a cover, can't it? That you are marrying a woman because that seems like yeah. it's religious cover. Everyone's going to look at that and say, yeah, they're yeah. a normal family. It's like a heterosexual it's couple. Being the beard in terms, it's like, you know, I'll pretend to date my gay friend just so that people think we're straight. <laughs> yeah, so you know? you're covering for each other yeah, in a sense. again yeah. to fit in. Again, yeah. And this thing totally happens, you know, it's like parents expect this way or. You know, people expect this way for you to be, and then it's like you'll try and fit in, you know, but it's not real, you know. It's like 
totally depressing. <laughs> but there's a tremendous yeah. amount of pressure. And as you were saying, as a little kid, this is something I've learned. This is a thing. It's called religious trauma syndrome, RTS. And in fact, there's an episode coming up at some point. I've been chatting with Laura Anderson, who is a therapist, and she's a specialist in religious trauma syndrome. That's one of the things that she does with her clients. And of course, this issue of sexuality in the church is a huge cause of RTS. As you say, you're scared, scared straight, yeah. as it were. Yeah. They attempt to control you through the message of fear and hell or whatever the punishment might be. Yeah. I mean, I know loads and loads of gay people who ha are brought up in a religious setting and, you know, it's a fear and it's also like, that's a sin. So like, you can't do that. And then it's like, well, how am I going to cope with myself and cope with this religion and cope with my family and friends and all I know? I mean, you, you put yourself in a box with all these people that have opinions and you can't get out of that box. So it's like you have to live that way to survive, even though that's not the way you would want to. It's escaping to be yourself, but it's like you lose everything. You know, it's very scary. And that's why people, you know, end up doing stuff to themselves or yeah, you know, live in denial. Suicide. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. It's it does. because they are meant to live this certain way and they can't live it. You know? Yeah, or they try to live it, but they, and we're going to talk about this in a minute with Brady, the issue of this cognitive dissonance when you're trying to hold to two completely contradictory, conflicting belief systems. This is who I am, but this is what I've been told. This is what I believe what happens. So if that sounds interesting to you, what we're talking about with me and Bray, we're going to come back and do a, a complete episode just her and I talking, but for now... It'll be wonderful. And it'll be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's go on into the conversation with Brady Harden. Hopefully that's whetted your appetite to listen to the episode that <laughs> Bree and I are going to do at some point. Maybe we'll do the recording this week and then the, the episode will drop Stay later tuned. on. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Subscribe. Subscribe to the channel. <laughs> Support on I Patreon. I know all these things. Come on now, folks. <laughs> Subscribe. Help us out. <laughs> So let's go on into it. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts and comments and feedback are as we listen to Brady Harden talking about suppressing my sexuality in order to fit in. Thank you so much for being a part of this show. Oh my God, my pleasure. Uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we connected through Twitter, I guess it was, wasn't it? But I've listened to your podcast as well. Oh, thank you. Times. Yeah. I used to not really care about Twitter, and then I was like, hey, I'm going to try this. And so it's been <laughs> cool to kind of meet new people and then reach out and find other people who are making stuff and helping people get out of fundamentalism. So I'm like, yeah, let's all just help each other out. I'm into this. It's a great community, I've found. I mean, there's always the trolls and stuff like that. Do you get trolled by, like, evangelicals and fundamentalists and people trying to win you back into the fold and correct your false beliefs and all that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In, in a word, had, yes. I had a while, like, there was this one ongoing apologetics boy. Like, he had to have been 23 at the latest, you know. And he was, like, to the point where he was, like, trying to comment on everything I said. But, you know, as a gay man now, I'm out, I'm proud. And I can use that gayness as a magical power to make people and fundamentalism uncomfortable. So all I had to do was just like retweet and be like, oh my God, my cute little apologetic boy. And then eventually <laughs> he's back. Right. So <laughs> that scared him off. There's a few that you, that you can engage in conversation with and it's helpful and it can be good. It's actually kind of like a weird exposure thing for me because, you know, after leaving my high pressure community, I had built up in my head oh, I'm intimidated by approaching these thoughts sometime. But years have passed. And now that I'm like older and I understand like critical thinking skills and then going back and like listening to apologetics, I'm like, this is so weak. It's alarming how weak it is. And it kind of dispelled it for me. So Twitter was kind of helpful in that weird way, you know? It disempowers it somehow. Mm, yeah, it's yeah, I, if you were like me, I was raised in fundamentalism. I was big into apologetics. I mean, I studied, yeah. you know, Josh McDowell. I studied Dr. Walter Martin. I used to listen to the Bible Answer Man radio show every uh, Friday. Uh, yep. yeah. Hank Hanegraaff. And I, <laughs> I, when Walter Martin was still alive, I listened to it every, well, it was every day. And then 
every week, you know, they'd have something. And I was like, yes, Christianity is, it makes so much sense. There's, there's so many answers. They've got all the answers, the Bible right. answer, man. And now, right. as you say, you, you get a few years of objectivity. You go, what the hell? I mean, really? In my up. My objectivity didn't really even come from a logical place initially, but then it turned into a very logical thing. For me, I, my a, a controlling factor in my entire life is that I truly believe that the Holy Spirit changed people from the inside out and made them more like God. So the more that we prayed and read our Bibles, saying, you know, the process of sanctification and becoming more godly, that uh, it would truly supernaturally change who we are. And whenever I went through a lot of spiritual abuse, I was like, Oh, nobody's defending me. And I know that I am right. It's not like an arrogance theme, like objectively, um, I'm being abused. I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to change and it's not happening. So that like had to be honest with my experience of saying, okay, this experience isn't lining up with my dogma. Um, the experience of being gay you know, I didn't choose that. I didn't want that. I begged God to change it for me. So that wasn't going in experience of what I was told. So then eventually I just made it like, okay, what should I start listening to? What I can see or what people tell me I should be seeing. And then that kind of like led to a whole thing, you know, and we'll deconstruct and uh, snow, what do you call it? Like an avalanche, right? Yeah. Once it started, you couldn't stop it. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? Because it's you're describing essentially, as I as I hear it, uh, cognitive dissonance, right? Mm-hmm. You're talking mm-hmm. about you're experiencing the dissonance. Your what you're being told doesn't match up with your experience. So there's a dissonance that's being created. How do you and and there's everyone needs to find a way to quiet that dissonance. And I find mm-hmm. a lot of people, and I did this too. I was just having this conversation last night with a woman out here. We had a huge rally this weekend at our place, and I, we, I got into this huge conversation about me, my deconstruction. She was absolutely fascinated by my story, and mm. she said, how did you get out? What, what were, was there like a tipping point or something? And I said, no, it was a long slide. A long, yes. and it took about 10 years to kind of – I didn't realize I was getting out mm. at the time, but it was the <laughs> cognitive dissonance. And what I found, a lot of people, they'll double down. And they'll find ways, and I did. I found ways to stay in. I would go yep. meet with mature Christians, and they would talk me off the cliff, and you know, give me all the answers. I don't know if that happened to you, but eventually, though, the weight of the cognitive dissonance can be just too much, and you can't take it anymore. And I think that's what I was experiencing during the spiritual abuse. I mean, it was like having so many things sitting on top of that. Uh, cognitive dissonance that it was eventually going to have to snap um, because my survival at that point and my ability to be, because just to give a little bit of background, it's like I uh, grew up very Southern Baptist. I, I was very evangelical when I was like 18 or 19. I had a phase where I didn't read any book, but the Bible it became very dogmatically Calvinistic because that was the most logical literary like extent that I could take things to. That was, that was my first deconstruction, right? Like whenever I switched from, oh, the prayer of salvation to, no, you know, Calvinism, blah, blah, blah. You're one and, of the elect. Yeah. And so people, because I was kind of like a local Christian celebrity in a weird way, people <laughs> lost their shit whenever I kind of made that switch. And then um, I knew that I was gay and attracted to men when I was 14, but I never was going to act on it. I repressed that as much as I could, prayed and prayed and prayed, never acted on it. Um, When I was 18, I started becoming open about, oh, I struggle with same-sex attraction, right? So there's that cognitive dissonance that we're talking about of like um, knowing that I'm one way and say that, oh, God's going to change my will, but really I'm begging God to do that and nothing's switching, you know? So I'm like, oh, well, I'm overcoming this, but really I'm just repressing. So there's that cognitive dissonance. And then um, I ended up getting married. We had a kid. I found out my wife was cheating. I found her Ashley Madison account. Trey took her back. We tried to work things out, but then like that, I just kept on discovering it over and over and over. I got help from our church and then she filed for divorce. And because I allowed her to file for divorce, I got disfellowshipped and kicked out. And it was at a point too, during that, that they were like doing counseling with us. Right. And they were controlling how often I was seeing my son. He was only like six months at the time, six months old. And it was at the point that if I didn't stand up for myself, if I just kind of like flowed with this cognitive dissonance bullshit of like, oh, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come in and he's going to fix this or he's going to, you know, finally stand up for me. He's really going to defend me. If I kept on relying on that, I could be without my son right now. Right. So I had to wake up 
And when I woke up and put my feet, you know, it's kind of like where you've seen that on the, on the internet, there's like a video of a little kid who's like in the shallow end of a pool and they're freaking out, holding on to the, the, but when they finally put their feet down, they realize that yeah, they're, they're like a way foot taller. Of water. <laughs> they're in a foot of water. That's what it was for me. That's what indoctrination was. And finally swallowing that, that cognitive distance and admitting to myself, oh, this is not a supernatural situation. These are people who think they're doing supernatural things with that certainty and making decisions for other people because of their arrogance and inability to see past their own indoctrination. I've got to jump ship or I'm going to get killed here. Like something's got to give. Literally. Right. Literally. Mm -hmm. It's so strange, isn't it? When, when God doesn't swoop in and fix everything. And yet we, we've been told that we got to put all of our faith, all of our trust in God, you know, and and we talk about purity culture. I'm not, I don't know if you came through that as a kid. But that's another one, isn't it? Where as a kid, you know, I of course knew that having sex before marriage was wrong and you had to stay a virgin till your wedding and all that. So what, what happens typically, isn't it? That kids, they get involved in pornography because that's, that's an outlet where you're, Mm -hmm. yeah, you're technically not having physical sex, but of course, you know, it's wrong. So you're begging God to help you stop this addiction. Mm. But of course he Mm. doesn't. So that mm. it's the same kind of trap, isn't it? Where you're stuck in this thing. And it's like, surely God help wants to help you stop sinning if that's the construct that you're going with. So in your case, if you're gay, that's according to evangelicalism, of course, that's wrong. And mm-hmm. it's not, a, it's against God's design and all the rest of it. So why isn't he fixing you then? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what, I, what I got into was even more of a double down into that. It was very much no lordship theology. If you're familiar with, pastors like paul washer oh, oh who is like i mean his main gimmick is um he just will suddenly start yelling at you and you jump on your seat and it's an it's fuck like that's like the same <laughs> thing about? like an abusive father does you know that like you where you feel like you're always this is what it felt like when i was in church i always felt like my body was just like in any moment you were going to be in danger you know, from being called out by somebody or, you know, it was just because, I mean, I was literally disfellowshipped and that was like a thing in my church where we really talked about the Lordship of like, um, if you really are saved, you're going to produce this fruit. And if you're having a hard time not producing this fruit, then you need to question if you're really saved or not. So here I am like going between, uh, I'm gay and I can't get rid of this. And I'm scared to death because I'm going to burn in hell probably if I can't get a handle on this even more. So then you just double down on it because of the fear. You don't double down because of logic. You double down on it because of the fear. That's it. I mean, we were talking before we hit the record button about how evangelicalism can use a lot of the similar tactics that cults, the cult psychology. I mean, everything you've just described, uh, my mind goes straight to the (laughs) the cults cults. because we're talking about behavior in the bite model you know, mm. behavior control, information control, thought control, emotional control. Damn, yes. So, mm-hmm. you know, you just described every one of those those markers of cults. If you're sitting in a church service and you're, you're fearful that you're going to get shouted at, that's emotional control, isn't it? Absolutely. I, heard, Absolutely. I heard someone say on a podcast the other day, they were talking about cults, and they said, if you can break someone down psychologically, then they're, they're in a, p- a position where you can better control them. And to me now, when I look at sermons and things like what you just described, you're talking about breaking people down, breaking mm-hmm. the barriers that then puts that pastor or preacher in a position where he can control them. Absolutely. I mean, where I came from with Calvinism, that's our first step, right? Total depravity. And when that doctrine teaches you is that you start off a like a, a, a flaming piece of shit that you are the you're enemy of God. That got, yeah, that you that you just that you're bound for it. You deserve it just for being born. Like it's weird what because as a Calvinist, we, we put a lot of emphasis on passive language and active language because we wanted to put an emphasis that salvation is a thing that's given to you. Right. But then we'll start talking about how you deserve to burn in hell because birth happened to you. Right. Because you were born a human. Well, they'll say, well, no, no, no. It was because, you know, you're born in this lineage, but, but it's like, okay, but that's the exact same thing practically as saying because you were born human right there's if there's no other exceptions outside of that then i could replace that with you're born human right, right so we didn't have a choice 
the and so the idea is you like born, you're already consigned to hell because of Adam's yeah. sin. It wasn't my fault, but it was somehow I'm I'm culpable. I'm I'm to blame for it. I have and nothing God's to do with my parents having sex. Nothing. <laughs> I just want that on the record. <laughs> you don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> nothing to do with this. Yeah. But that's but, the thing I mean, with Calvinism is mm. if you pack it, unpack it, yeah. So God has chosen a certain number of humans from before the world was created, according to this mm. theology, for yeah. to go to heaven. The others have no choice. They're apparently consigned to hell. And if you're one mm. of the elect, you're going to heaven. I mean, we I know there's very it. we would there. word it differently. But that's essentially course. what they're saying. That's it. You're oh, one absolutely. of the elect. You're you're guaranteed to heaven. And of course, the, the one of the main implications of that is if you're a Christian, then you can treat others like absolute shit because it doesn't matter. You've got your golden ticket to heaven. So I think that explains in one way why Christians treat people so horribly. What, why should I care? Because I'm going to heaven, man. I'm one of the elect. Right. And like you've been saying on the show, when we talk, we were talking about the, the, the family, right? Like that was a yeah. big thing in there is you, you see how inside of the family how they operate and when it's their people there's a second standard of rules that applies to them and what calvinism does too is whenever it filters your thoughts and your brains and your in your in your experience through your brain by um putting it through the filter of if there's anything positive or good then it definitely did not come from you but if there is something good that happens then you have to attribute it to god and so with constantly having that your brain conditioned to categorize your experience and categorize your thoughts in that way. Um, you just find yourself even deeper and deeper and deeper into it because you're adding all this, like, because your brain needs evidence, right? Your, your, your brain wants logic and it's maybe not the most educated on knowing how to get logic or not, unless you educate yourself. Right. But yeah. whenever you have a weak standard of what is considered evidence for your belief system, um, your brain kind of looks for that and fills it. And so when you're filtering your experiences, that becomes the evidence that your brain needs. And then it feels safe for a while until you realize, oh, that's not really working for everybody. Yeah, that doesn't really doesn't fit, fit critical thinking skills or it doesn't fit my new experience. So what is reconstruct or deconstruction then is you have a new standard, an evolved standard, and now you filter all of your belief, like your dogmatic beliefs and narratives through that new filter and say, okay, what's going to survive and what isn't? Um, some people during their deconstruction focus a lot on like what's considered moral and what's right. And so a lot of times they may deconstruct and come out as like a liberal Christian uh, which is great if that works for them. But for me, it wasn't just that. It was also, okay, is this stuff moral? Is it right? Is this how I want to treat people? And did this really happen? And then that kind of got me to out of it completely and, and into like, uh, now I can sort of like an atheist or secular humanist where I understand like I can treat people well and I can still have the golden rule, but it's even easier for me now that I don't have all these extra rules and extra things to add on to it. Um, so even from a practical standpoint, the way that I treat people and the way that I treat myself um, is changing because my dogma is leaving. And I love that. That's it. It's so interesting when you uh, we get some of that objective distance and you're stepping back a few years after you've walked away from the whole thing. Because something that my sister Valerie and I talked about, she didn't realize this until probably four or five years after leaving the church and walking away from all that. She suddenly woke up one day and kind of realized that the way she interacted with other people was utterly different than when she was a Christian because it was all about proselytizing when she was a Christian. So every single relationship that she would make with a new person, a coworker or a friend or something, it always had to be couched in the terms of proselytization. I'm going to build a relationship with this person for the purposes of sharing the gospel. And she realized that she went out with a bunch of coworkers one day. They had a drink at a pub and they went home and she was like, wait a minute. We didn't talk about God. I didn't feel compelled <laughs> to bring up the Bible the yeah. whole time. I just had yeah. a good time with new friends. And it hit her like a, a bolt of lightning that this has really, really impacted my life in a major way. And mm. I'm feeling all this anxiety to have to constantly slip the gospel in every conversational crack. You know, so yeah, it, it God, does affect your life. Big time. That is such a good point. 
I used to feel that way. I mean, I, I've told the story about every time I flew on an airplane, I would drag my Bible along and, uh-huh. I'd, sit there and I'd pretend to read it on the plane, <laughs> you know, yeah. in the hopes that my seatmate would see what I was doing and go, hey, what are you reading there? Oh, I'm reading the Bible. Let's have a conversation and I'll leave God. the Christ. And I feel terrible if I didn't have that conversation when I was mm-hmm. getting off the plane. So just anxiety, constant, you know, worrying about this stuff. That God's mm. disappointed with you. So, yeah, it makes a big difference. And one thing you're saying, it really clicks with me, is I think that one of the first things that kind of leads us towards having that sort of attitude that your sister is describing, which is my life, you know, I, I get that. Um, is the first step is to kind of like shut yourself off from new information and to kind of get this attitude that I'm here to give the flow of information is going to go from me to you. Right. And I'm going to find ways for me to cleverly do that, but you're not looking for ways of, Oh yeah. But how do I also listen to see if maybe it's a check to see if what I'm saying is right. No, because you're unlikely to be on the, on the defensive and you're going to, because you've been conditioned to think that it only goes in that one direction. Um, and I, I was talking to some people about that today of just how, what was it like to get past that? What was it like to start listening? And I think for a lot of us, um, it kind of requires some of us that were really dogmatic myself. Like I, if it was not for the spiritual abuse that I went through, you know, and it wasn't just the church kicked me out. Like I went back and I defended myself. The church admitted they were wrong, but then they drug their feet to like getting me back and go to see. There was a lot of steps that like could have happened that didn't happen. And finally, whenever I like went through all of that, is when I question, but I don't think that if it wasn't for those really hard life situations, I don't know if I would have woken up um, for another, who knows how long. If know? at all. If at all. Well, you could have, did you have to go through con- any sort of conversion therapy? I mean, that's a whole nother piece. Right. Because I've, I've been it's thinking. It's funny you say that because I think honestly, I mean, I was, I wanted to, I was trying to be the sp- this the little poster boy on that shit, right? That like, oh, I've known I'm gay since I was 14 and I've repressed myself and I've married a woman and I have a kid. And um, and so th- I, I think like I, this week I was talking to one of my friends, like I think I probably would be involved in fucking convert with the whole Bethel Redding stuff that's happening right now where they're trying to bring mm-hmm. it back and repackage it and uh, the same old bullshit. I, I, I look at that and I'm like, I, I probably would have tried to be part of that because I felt like I would have was doing all the right things. But really I was, repressing it and to find out like my ex-wife when she was cheating um she says that it had to do a lot of like mental health stuff and postpartum i get that another Mm -hmm. thing too is to find out over all these years that like she wasn't able to be herself either she came out last year and is now engaged to her uh female partner i did not see that coming at all uh but i was supportive of it (laughs) Yeah. totally new but it's just a thing that like when you don't allow yourself access to all parts of yourself your brain your sexuality your emotions the the all the steps that you talked about with the uh, culture high pressure communities when you don't have access to all those things it's because you're being cut off from those resources so that you will stay in the situation you're in if you want to know why fundamentalism hates professional therapy that's why because that's why. it is a step of Ignat like looking at yourself, analyzing things and working through your problems without needing a supernatural narrative. And soon when you kind of figure out how to do that stuff, the supernatural narratives kind of, you know, they wane away. Yeah. I was thinking you must have had, you've got a double whammy in a way that, okay, so you're an ex evangelical, but also coming out as gay because as you say about your Twitter troll uh, friend, you know, (laughs) friend, (laughs) because <laughs> those of us that haven't had that extra issue to deal with, you know, mm. I, I didn't come, I, I was just coming out of the, the, theolo- the theology and the biblical stuff and all that mm. and dealing with, you know, re- re- religious trauma and everything else. But then to add that other piece, that, I don't know, how have you coped with all of that as well? Cause that's obviously a big issue in fundamentalism. Well, to find cope. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> but here's like, like I, mean, I was disfellowshipped. I, I lost everyone, right? So I was disfellowshipped. I was completely like strategically cut off my community. Um, somebody outed me to my mom at that time, even though I wasn't like being, I wasn't doing any, I was, my family was the only people I wasn't able to be open about with my struggle because I knew the homophobia. 
And so somebody outed me to my, my family. One of my family members tried to say that I should have my son overnights. And so like I had to fight for custody on top. Like, so after everything finally settled down and I was able to take a breath, you know, um, you, it, it kind of just falls into place. Like one thing for me, when I was finally able to practice on being gay, I was 28 years old. Uh, this was like, it, the, the, I don't think the divorce is final, but it was like happening. And I was like stepping out of the faith. Cause I was like, I'm, so done. And I finally downloaded Grinder for the first time. And I finally just went on a uh, talk to the guy. We we had a conversation. It wasn't we knew exactly what our expectations were. Uh, went into a situation and I was able to like have a casual sexual encounter for the first time in my life. Uh, and the first time even touching a guy at all at twenty eight. And so going into that, I thought I was going to have so much shame. Like that's what kept me fearful this whole time. Right. Oh yeah. Is the shame of like, Oh my God, if I acted upon this, I would lose everything. I would, you know, whatever. You've definitely crossed the line. Yeah. There's no return. Right. (laughs) It was never going to be a possibility for me. And then, you know, that happened. And afterwards I remember the next morning I, I was, uh, I saw myself in the mirror and I high fived myself because it just felt like, that shame and all that buildup, I put my feet down and realized that I'm a fuck taller than that water, that shallow water. Like, um, I'm stronger than that. I'm bigger than that. And uh, they could make me fear putting my feet down or I could do it and realize that they really just fear me and they fear me yeah. being me uh, and they fear their people being themselves and they fear themselves being themselves because indoctrinated people indoctrinate people. It's just... It's true. Producing robots that produce robots. And especially if you were born into it like me. Isn't that right? So you were born yeah. into the church. So you and I, I think we didn't have a chance in the sense that we were born into the system. I consider this, you know, because I was raised in the Bill Gothard stuff. That mm. That's an absolute cult. I, I've oh, I yeah. studied it. I've researched it. It's a cult. Uh, so I see I, 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 it's like a blinding revelation to me. Mm. Hey, I was raised in a cult. And in a fundamentalist church. So with parents that raised us according to Gothard's principles and the damage that that did to us. And my whole family's fucked, basically, Um, because you can just look at every one of my sisters and they've got or they've had major issues because of our upbringing, the mm -hmm. religious abuse, the spiritual, you know, abuse, the religious trauma and everything else. It's a mess. And that's because of that legacy. So we, we getting out of that is a lot more difficult than people who may have joined it later in life and then kind of woke up and said, whoa, I got to get out of this thing. Yeah, yeah. And and it, and it's, from day one. And it's funny now, too, of like being, like I said, of trying Twitter more and trying to connect more with people online. If interacting with other atheists who don't understand the indoctrination and they don't have empathy that for that because they haven't experienced it. So trying to, I'm trying to be as much of a platypus as I can um, and trying to speak as much to the duck community as I can. The, uh, what is the other half of a platypus? Like the duck build platypus. Yeah. <laughs> whatever know. the other, like, you know, it's whatever like a mix between a, yeah, you get it. Duck. I don't know. There we go, beaver. So I'm trying to talk to the beaver community and the and the duck community, you know, as this duck pill platypus in the middle and trying to be explain of like, um, this is what it was like to believe that stuff and to be stuck in that mind prison because mm. I think what people believe keeps people in is stupidity. But really what it is is a reconditioning of the direction of their empathy. That their mm. empathy has been kind of bent and turned into a, a, a weird way that is perverted, but it's now something that should be getting them out is now been the thing pushing them back in. So mm. I think helping people realize that it's like the good parts of people that need help getting out of things. They need a little bit of a revival of how to find their, their, their principles of what's important to them. And I think that those things will happen naturally, but um, yeah, just, yeah, that's just been a big thing for me is realizing, God, people who haven't been indoctrinated don't get it. And those who were indoctrinated as kids get it in a different way. And then those who have been indoctrinated just for a little bit and walked out, there's so many different levels. And I love that we're able to have these conversations, right? And then be able to say, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying, but this is what it was actually like. And then I think that helps us communicate better because now we're able to kind of 
combine those resources and people's experiences and find better ways to word things that are going to help kind of be a leverage inside of people's cognitive dissonance to get them out. Um, Cause like my big thing was I realized the, my main problem was I was constantly accepting conclusions like supernatural narratives and conclusions. Oh, yeah. I would accept those prepackaged um, and then I would put them on the same level as, well, what if we just hit reset and like today with all of the knowledge and information and resources we have, what if we just hit reset today? Will we come to the same conclusions? And so that was kind of that process is what really what kind of got me thinking hard about how is my cognitive dissonance there, but I was at present and how do I get rid of it and keep a check on it, keep it accountable. Well, I just I saw your tweet we were talking about before that you tweeted today that little uh, meme or whatever about spiritual bypassing. Mm. You know, when we say this, what we mean in the church is this. And it's like, uh, I, I saw it in- instantly and my, my mind went to the cult psychology of it. The thought terminating cliche or loaded language. And that's classically what it is. A way to suppress that cognitive dissonance is that mm-hmm. you just throw platitudes at it. You know, God's oh, I like that. Yeah. God will solve this problem. Everything works together for the good to those who love him. And, you know, v- Bible verses and all these cliche, they're thought terminating cliches. That's exactly what they are, you know, and that's how cults control their members. That's how the church controls people. Hey, I've got a problem. No, here comes some platitudes <laughs> that's going to okay. solve your problem. I love that. And there's like a whole genre of platitudes that are specifically for people who are deconstructing or thinking about deconstructing or questioning. Right. So some of those platitudes are like, uh, you know, that I get a lot of like, well, Brady, you just need to look at man or you need to look to God, not man, because man's going to, you know, man's going to disappoint you. Well, then show me where God stepped up and did anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if, And if me seeing what you see requires for me to jump into some narrative and assume that that was right, blah, 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 blah. if if I need a whole bunch of prerequisites to be able to see what you see, then I kind of feel like the emperor just might be naked and you might just be looking at his neck, right? Like, (laughs) I I think you might just be seeing his body hair and assuming that it's a sweater. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, that's kind of like the thing for me is like, um, if you say that something's self-evident and is clear, then let it be self-evident. Uh, but when you're telling people, don't, don't look, you know, don't question too hard, um, which is what we're getting right now, right? Because there's this big influx of people leaving fundamentalism and, and even like bigger names now. And so each time that that's happening, it's creating a splash. Then you get all the Christians coming back and saying, okay, well, what's really happening is they're just not trusting Jesus enough. Um, or I read for a, this article from Together from the Gospel, oh my God, where they're like, you know, I've noticed that everybody who's apostate now, they just don't have anything negative to say about Jesus. I think they just don't understand Jesus. It's like, no, that's we what it is. did all of that. We did. <laughs> You're right. not so listening. Hard. Right. Well, uh, all this fl- uh, flap around Josh Harris and is it Marty Sampson, the guy from Hillsongs? Samson or Simpson? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's Samson. He, he quit recently, and it, I've I've read articles too. Same kind of thing. An open letter to Josh Harris and all this kind of stuff, Jesus and Christ, just yeah. ripping him to shreds. You know, mm-hmm. that, that was the guy, the lead singer of Skillet. Did you see his Facebook post? John Cooper. Oh my God! Yeah, yes. it was. It, here's the premise of it. It was uh, maybe we should stop listening to famous Christian artists but only after I finish this blog I was gonna post. Say, yeah. Aren't you a famous <laughs> Christian artist? <laughs> yeah, because I want to close the door on the way out. And it, yeah, it also right. killed me too that like he kind of like took a nudge at the word relevant. And it's like, dude, your face is on relevant magazine. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, and it's not a figure of speech. There literally is a magazine named Liter- relevant that you are on. Like, it's, yeah, the oh, irony. Break. The irony is it's so rich. So thick. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I agree with the, the point that he made about, yeah, we need to stop putting these Christian leaders up on pedestals and all that, because when I was a pastor, that's what they did to me, you know, and yeah. it was, it was, I didn't want it to happen, but it, it's human nature. I think they, they put you up on a pedestal. They expect you to be this super spiritual person. And yet all they do is criticize and throw stones at you when you get up there. So it's a, it's a, being a pastor is a thankless, you know, exhausting job. I would never be a pastor ever, ever again for that very yeah. reason alone, other than the fact they would never have me back. 
<laughs> there is that too. There's that too. I mean, I was a youth pastor for a while and mm. um, I was involved in a, a Christian sitcom that was on cable. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was so bad. Clint, it was so bad. Why did you like just a, admit that though? <laughs> be, just to show that like... <laughs> How bad okay. it really was. There, there is like a very dark corner of my mind that right. is disgustingly proud of the weird <laughs> sitcom. What you did. Okay? Yeah, it was, it was bad, but like, but the point is that like, when you, I mean, I've got letters from the same people who dis, who disfellowship to me that say how certain they are of the fruit of the spirit and the Lord's work in my life. I mean, they sent me out on mission trips. They sent me to, you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, we so all it's kind of like thing. when you really back people up like that and then they get older and evolve, that's going to come around and bites you in the butt with really sharp evolved teeth you know like that needs to be a thing that they're and i think that they're going to have to learn that um but they only have a small window of time i feel like to learn that shit and to evolve to it because we're working at a different pace than 2000 mm. years ago we have the internet we have social media we have fact checking we have science we have so many more discoveries than what they had before that this information there's not a coincidence that now that this information is out to people that it's also the same time that fundamentalism is kind of like losing its power the more information we have the more resources we have the more abilities we have to um, fact check things the smaller fundamentalism is going to have to be, or they're going to have to evolve and figure out a way to make it in this era. Well, it's true, isn't it? Because something Tim Sledge, he he was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said, "I that, like him. Yeah, I follow him on Twitter. Jesus. He's one of my favorites." Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said that he heard a quote somewhere that said something like, "As every time the rate of change increases in a given society, fundamentalism also reacts and tries to stop it and tries to." go back to the way it was. They try to control mm. things. And that's sort of a, a truism, I guess you could say. <clears throat> Shit, yeah. You've seen it historically. Every time things feel out of control, there's always a group that says, we need to freeze this thing. We need to solidify it. We need to stop it. And we see that with you know the control <sighs> of fundamentalism yeah. today. I mean, we were talking about the family. That's one thing. And they figured out a way to get, to get in there through the back door. They're doing yeah. it. We don't know what the fuck they're doing. Literally. Yeah meeting yeah. presidents and prime ministers and dictators and billionaires and oligarchs and all sorts of people all over the world. And they're slipping their fundamentalist agenda into political sectors. That's frightening. And th we see the results. I mean, you talk mm -hmm. about the two things that came up in the series, uh, Uganda and uh, Romania, both yeah, Jesus. about the anti LGBT issue. I mean, I'm, I would be dead, right? Like, yeah, if, if you those were laws in passed. Uganda, you'd be up for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. you were, luckily, it didn't pass in Romania, but it, it nearly did. And the family was behind all that. Pulling and I had a Romanian, I had a Romanian roommate for a while, Clint. He could have killed me in my sleep. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> just Gotta watch out. At least he wasn't Ugandan, though. That's true. That might have been a problem. And I liked it. It was kind of like a perfect stranger. This, the, the, mm -hmm. this thing about family values, quote unquote. Yes. When they say that, I, I believe that's just code word, codes for saying what we mean by that is one man, one woman in a monogamous, monogamous marriage. So yeah. no same sex marriage is allowed. So my daughter, who's gay, she's married to a female. She's not going to ever travel to Uganda or Romania because it's illegal or it's going to be yeah. there. They're trying. You yeah. know, so it's it's affecting real people's lives, this fundamentalism. And it's interesting that you mention it to like political because I feel like I never really got into politics until like, you know, after I, my deconstruction. And it hit me of like how many of the same things that we can see that's happening on a regular basis is, is that happened 2000 years ago. And that's how the, the misinformation campaign got started. Right. So we've got things like, um, you know, don't trust your eyes, you know, have faith. Blind faith. But blind faith is kind of like the jump start. Like when your lawnmower needs that, that cord yank, you need something to initiate that. That's what blind faith is. They get you stuck into circular reasoning, right? 
right? Mm -hmm. Of like, well, now if I believe, if I just jump and say, well, I believe the Bible. Well, now the Bible says that the Bible is true. So now I'm going to believe the Bible because the Bible says the Bible is true. I'm going to believe the Bible because, you know, but you need that one thing to kind of yank and assert that, that, a thing and so we see those same things happening to us politically right the same sort of misinformation of look less look over here look at this but the difference between progression and conservation is conservation is here's this like i said before the sit the set of conclusions a family is supposed to look this way. Um, your life is supposed to look, women are supposed to look this way. You're supposed to be filling these roles now fit those or what progression is. And this is what we could see in evolution. This is what we could see in a macro like societal way or even just like individual organisms. The, the process is you don't have senses. Then you grow ways to have senses. You use those senses to gather information that information, you learn from it, and you learn a strategy based on that information, and then you progress and you grow. And so I could say a family is supposed to be a man, a woman, and, you know, two kids, or I could look around to me and say, oh, well, my family, I've got a son who goes between my house and his mom and, and her uh, going to be fiance or fiance partner, or partner's yeah. house. Um, and that's what our family looks like. So I could say a family should look like this, or I could use what evolution has given me, and I could use by steps of progression of learning what's actually there and observing instead of assuming. There's a huge difference. And I could say, no, this is what a family looks like. And now I can create a better family based on what I have because I can create tools and resources based on reality instead of what somebody is telling me should be reality. And so that sort of progression and understanding that flow of direction of like, that's kind of my higher power at this point, right? That's where you're and going. I recognize that like, I could still use narratives to teach people to go in this progression, um, that it's more about adding people than it is subtracting people. And each one of these things just kind of like all flows into the same thing in my head of, or oh, I could accept conclusions or... I could figure shit out on my own and probably come up with something better because I have more knowledge and more experiences now in 2019 than they did in year, you know, 300 or whatever First when century. the Bible was being yeah. written. Right. And that's been a huge difference for me in life. It's a major shift, isn't it? Well, thinking about what you just said, if, if you're a heterosexual couple with a couple of kids, you're going to fit right into most mainstream evangelical churches, right? You're going to be that poster family. They're made for you mm -hmm. unless you're in a super liberal accepting inclusive type church you are not allowed to go into that or situation but you, you think wait a minute if god is the one who's behind all this why is there such repression and spiritual abuse and it's the same kind of question that hit me the other day that i was thinking about the old testament the the law when god was ruling over the nation of israel you read about it in the bible now, to me, he is, he, if he's the creator of humanity, he should know human psychology better than anyone. Mm -hmm. obviously. Preach. You so made it right. Why? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> when God had his chance to set up a theocracy, a kingdom over which he himself is ruling, mm. it should have been utopia. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't it have been? I mean, yeah. in, and in a smaller way, the church should be a form of a, a utopia. Exactly. It should be the, the best place every, everyone should want to be and should be. But yet we see the exact opposite. The Old Testament mm -hmm. was a terrible, horrible place with a bunch of really strict and very – some insane laws, really, that God ordained. It's like all of you know, God's old so tweets good. that he wants to forget about. <laughs> yeah. He can't you know purge I mean? his old tweets now, though. <laughs> right. The God of the Old Testament. And, you know, so for a person going into a church that doesn't fit that mold, mm. where do they go? They they must have to change then to, you know, and then you, can, you can be psychologically broken down and they can rebuild you in their likeness and everything else. Oh, shit. Oh, Clint, I was going to mention this earlier and I completely forgot. When, when we're talking about breaking people down, right? Like, I remember specifically listening to a lot of like Way of the Master Mm. You remember that shit, you know? Yep. And I read an article on like um, the Chinese, like there was a, a study done on brainwashing and the steps of brainwashing in Chinese internment camps. And they fit the exact same steps that 
Ray Comfort does in the way of the master. You break mm-hmm. people down, you you get them to where they admit that they could be wrong, and then you you know they get to the bottom, then you rebuild them, blah blah blah. But it's the same thing is you want people to fit into this category, these categories. And you know, for me, I was willing to repress my sexuality for, you know, until I was 28 years old to do it because not because I just wanted to be because I truly believed that it wasn't when you're indoctrinated, you don't ask, is this real or not? You ask, is this good or not? And, and if it's, it's good, all then true. You, it's all got to be true. Then it's going to be. It is right. true. Yeah. It's true. So, yeah. It's just that. you, you conform so, yeah. to these roles that you don't need to ever force yourself into. Well, and something I was thinking about too, when we were talking about being raised in fundamentalism or being raised in a cult versus the person who joins it later and then leaves Mm. Something I've come across is really fascinating is that there is a big difference between those two groups of people. Yes, they both left, but the person who walked into it and then left, in a sense, they had a previous identity because they, they, you know, they had a chance to form an identity before they started this religion or cult. Then they got out of it. They can go back and kind of reconnect with their original self. But for people like you and me, our only identity was ever and only was that religious identity. We never had another identity outside. So we've got to go back and completely rebuild everything. Who am I? What kind of a person am I? I mean, it sounds like you're getting in touch with the real Brady Harden that was suppressed and oppressed for all those Mm -hmm. years. And you're buying, buying into their downloads. You know, that's the way it works. But you know, what's interesting though is, and I, and I love this because I, I, God, I hate how many times I make this comparison. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, but Pokemon, okay, I'm not a huge Pokemon fan, but I swear I make this comparison so often everybody's going to think that I'm like Ash Ketchum himself or, <laughs> you know, some Team Rocket fan. But, like, it's kind of like the whole you, – you have Charmander, and he's just like a little uh, – and then there's, like, Charmeleon, then he's just Charizard, right? And so I look at my, like, Char- Charmander. I was, like, little Baptist boy who just wanted people to ask Jesus in their heart. And then there was Charmeleon, who was an annoying piece of shit Calvinist, who, <laughs> you know, just loved that. And then there's now I'm, like, at this Char – I'm going to call myself Charizard. I'm going to own it. I'm Charizard, damn it. And that's, that's because, true. like, now I recognize that – the things that evolved me to where I am now still kind of are part of me because what got me into indoctrination were narratives, stories. I heard stories as a kid and I believe them. Um, Now that I'm older, I'm obsessed with like Joseph Campbell and learning about the importance of narratives and how they educate people, how it's like a very unique tool that only our species has. Like Mm -hmm. Sapiens is a really good book that talks about like, here's like the macro history of our, of our society, species. And one of the first things he talks about is like, yeah, we're monkeys who figured out how to do storytelling. And that's what is able to kind of like unite us. So now what am I doing through my podcast? What are you doing in your podcast is we're letting people tell their narratives of how they were in Christianity and how they got out. And so I'm realizing that really it's not a complete reset as I thought for years. Right. Mm. But more of a taking the tools that work and actually using them for a progressive meaning. In other words, instead of trying to shove a narrative into another narrative, I'm going to like make a narrative based on what is real and let it be honest of what it is, you know, because I don't think that there's too much more. I don't think that there could be too much more powerful than a thing that a person who's honest about narratives and use that for good, you know, because it is what, changes us it's what makes us as a species different it changes our minds it changes our influences it changes how we operate so i'm hoping to be able to use those powers now right for good to kind of push people to a point where they're not going towards one goal but now they're able to kind of use those narratives to reflect and to find who they are based on reality and not based on something that's been handed to them um so long term wise like for me, I'm hoping that like I'll be able to write fiction again, which is like hard for me because I used to only be able to really commit to a project if I felt that it was going to be for this dogmatic, you know, glory of God you cause, God. right? And so now I'm having to reprogram, <laughs> deprogram, right, my yeah. mind to be able to use those same things, but in a positive way with my new morals and ideas and 
influences, you know. But of course, the argument is, is that as an atheist, you don't have any moral compass. That's what they say, isn't it? Without <laughs> God, you've got no moral compass. You, you could be out murdering people in the street. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That was a Calvinist. We ate, we ate yeah. that shit up. We oh, ate that yeah. shit up. And it's so funny to me now because um, I, I've realized like a really easy way to, to kind of like talk to people and kind of get them to question their beliefs is to let them see the morality of God and say, okay, is this your, is this really your morality? Are you, you okay want? with this? Because we have so much morality now that is like no, no contest. We accept it. And, but it, it didn't happen because of the Bible. It happened in spite of the Bible. Mm. And when I started to see that, that I'm like, Oh shit. Well, what about other cultures? They've just been raping and murdering each other this whole time. Right? Like anybody who's not a Christian. And I'm like, Oh no, their, their religions are saying some similar things about morality. And then I was like, Oh, the golden rule is just humanism because it's, treat people the way people want to be treated as people there's nothing about god inside of that you know so i started to have to reprogram how i look at morality and oh shit it was not at all how i was taught it was people to find out people can figure out that murdering others is a bad thing and open heart surgery Uh, i didn't know people were able to figure out both of those things, right? Yeah, that's like a shocking thing. Shocking. <laughs> well, I remember a couple of years ago talking to Dr. Hector Avalos. I don't know if you come across his work, but yeah, yeah, no. he wrote a book called The Bad Jesus. And it's quite interesting because what he does is he deconstructs these teachings of Jesus and his whole premise is what you just talked about. He says that evangelicals have, they've deified Jesus in a way that he was never really meant to be in the gospels. Mm. That in a, in a way they put him up on a, an untouchable pedestal. Mm. Everything Jesus said was completely original. Everything Jesus said was just a mind blowing, you know, spiritual guru level type stuff. And he goes through and he says, "Well, actually, a lot of the stuff that Jesus said was not original, and it was it was in writing four or five hundred years before in completely yeah. secular societies or other societies that has that have no connection with." Israel or or the Old Testament. And so he goes through and he's like, you guys haven't done your homework here. You put Jesus up on this pedestal. And in fact, Jesus said a lot of things that are quite troubling. And like yeah. you said, the God of the Bible has a lot of skeletons in the closet. So it's the answer for it. <laughs> well, and it's weird. You got these dominion theologians that want to put the Ten Commandments into practice in American law. Mm. But most yeah. of the Ten Commandments are completely crazy. You should have no graven images. You shouldn't worship any other gods except for, you know, Yahweh. Uh, you know, okay, what, how do you, how are you going to, you know, enact that law? It's crazy. And at least Satan, and at least Satanism comes out and says, don't rape people. Yeah. Crazy, right? Like, it's crazy. I mean, that seems, that seems like a no, no brainer to add into the Bible. Yeah. Not, well, oh, I, if it happens and your dad gets to decide if you're going to marry the guy or not. No, I think you should pay just pay a fine and you get to marry the rapist. That. I mean, God. some insane laws. Yeah, if your kids yeah. are giving you a problem, you drag them out in the public square and have them stoned to death. Exodus yeah. twenty-two, or what is it, Crazy. twenty-one? About you can stone your you can stone your slave because they're your property. You just don't kill them. You've got Numbers five, which is about oh, has your wife been unfaithful? Well, drink this drink that we made out of dust that we found in a temple floor, and it may or may not abort your baby and mm. make your um, your womb dissolve. What the fuck? Magical like, thinking. Yeah. Bonkers. Bonkers, right? But yeah, this is the God who commanded all this stuff. This is the this is what I'm saying. This is this should have been a utopian society. But it's so far from that. And like your point mm-hmm. about if that's where we're gonna get our morality from, this is what people like the family, that's what they want to do though. They want to mm-hmm. enact a theocracy whereby mm-hmm. Christians are in charge. And that is the last thing that we want. It's basically yeah. a version of the Taliban. It's, oh, it's yeah. handmaid's tale. We're, this is what we're talking about. You know, this is not a fun, pleasant, good society that we want to be a part of. I guarantee that nobody wants fundamentalists ruling the the country or the world. But yet, exactly. that's their goal. You know, exactly. so this is very concerning. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm doing a lot of work on it. Yeah, it 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 troubles me a lot i mean because another thing too is like i said i truly believe that the holy spirit changed people from the inside out right mm-hmm. and so if that was the if that was the, 
the, the, the truth, then Christians would be the on the forefront of fighting for social justice issues, especially ones that we're eventually going to accept and that they're going to pretend we're part of their morality the entire time whenever it gets to that point in our society. For example, when it comes to like um, accepting gay people, there's a lot of like liberal Christians that are, are to the point now where they're like, no, this is bonkers that we're being homophobic. Mm. Let's just love gay people. I love that they did that. I think that it's very, very important. But also have to see that it's not because of the religion that they got there. It's despite of what the religion teaches. And now they're having, and, and I'm glad that they're doing it. I don't agree with it, but whatever. Now they're having to change the religion to fit in that direction. And I think that that's, that's good. That's fine. That's great. But still give credit to the people who are being oppressed and that are being abused by this, because it's really their voices crying out. That's making yeah. the change, not the ones who finally 2000 years later, are like, wait, should we listen to oppressed people? I think mm. we should, <laughs> What a you know, like I would rather give more attention to those who are being oppressed or fighting for these things. Right. And I, I don't know. That's where I'm like seeing this disconnect of like, if the Holy spirit really was the one influencing, if you really cared about these things and changing people, people from the inside out, there would be number one, a little bit of consistency. And number two, there would be a push to get more people help and not less people based on something that they can't change because of how they were born. Right. When you have to be so, careful, you know, cause I remember talking to a friend when I was in Portland last year and uh, he, he used to be our associate pastor when I was a pastor and we met up, I haven't seen him in like 10 years and he's gone through <laughs> quite a journey, but we were talking about this issue of inclusion in churches. And he said what he's discovered as he went around looking around Portland to try to find a church to attend. He said that, that was one of the questions, you know, are you open? Are you affirming? Are you inclusive and all that? And they would say, well, yes, we are. We're totally open. We're totally affirming. We're, and he's, wow, this is really interesting. And, but what he would find out was what they meant by that was yeah. we welcome people of all sexual orientation. However, what we really believe is going to happen is you're going to come into our church. You won't be condemned. You won't be turned away. You'll be welcomed and loved. But when you get saved, then God will change you and make you straight. You know, affirmation. Yeah. Affirmation never ends with like affirmation never ends with now let's change. you. Exactly. So it's not really inclusion. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's kind of like a cycle of like an abusive parent or an abusive relationship. Right. It is really, Oh, I love you exactly how you are. You're great. You're wonderful. I'm really glad you're here, but uh, by the way, to I need you yeah. to change. I need you to things. change an essence of who you are. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty important. Well, and, and the magical formula is that, like you were saying, it's the Holy Spirit who's mm-hmm. going to change you. Because I was talking to someone the other day about when I was in Christian counseling, I took a class at Bible College called Introduction to Christian Therapy or Christian Counseling, mm-hmm. and the model was, she said, "This is how Christian counseling works." You take a person back to their past traumas and all that, and you you walk them back through whatever issues they have. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And then she said, when you get back to the real root causes of what their problems are, that's when the Holy Spirit fixes it. (laughs) You know, and that's the model that this particular woman was saying, yes, this is Christian therapy. And so in that, if you put it in that context, you could say, this let's say this gay person comes in they're not discriminated against they're welcomed Mm -hmm. but the hidden agenda is we're going to get them saved and the spirit will fix them and turn them straight and then they'll be okay so that's kind of i think was the expectation in my spiritual abuse situation when it was coming to Mm -hmm. you know when um my ex-wife was like still maintaining his relationship through Ashley Madison, et cetera. And uh, they, they were doing all the gospel things. They were doing all the magic. They were saying all the magic words, but the gospel never showed up and did the magic. And so mm-hmm. they needed somebody to blame that on. And right. because, you know, it wasn't working with their expectations, they couldn't reflect and say, oh, maybe our expectations and our understanding are misinformation by indoctrination that wasn't a, that wasn't a choice that's not on it the was, table we have to double down and blame someone i have <laughs> yeah. an idea how about this kid brady you know and that's he's kind of fault. how that yeah he's at fault yeah it must be you obviously mm-hmm. well i'm glad to hear that you're you know in touch with your kind of authentic self 
Thank How you. have you been able to do that? Because one of the things we had our Zoom call last month with our, our podcast group on Facebook, Janice Selby, she said, she's a therapist, and she said, the thing about religious trauma is it's a double whammy. Because on the one hand, you're getting abused while you're in the system. So you're getting trauma while you're in the church or in the fundamentalist organization, whatever. And then when you leave, there's another set of abuse because you're being shunned and you're being mm-hmm. ostracized. And you, you lose the community. You lose Your friends. voice doesn't matter. Yeah. And so it's a double whammy. It's, it's on the front and the back end. So that, those are two things that have both happened to you. It sounds like you were yeah. traumatized while you were in the system and then you were ostracized after you left. So it's, it's how have you been able to work through that? Therapy. Yeah. Um, I, I can't. That's one thing, like Chuck, my co-host uh, for The Life After and I, that's like one thing that we we really are strong on because when we recommend therapy, we're not saying, hey, go see our therapist or listen to our type of therapy. We're saying, hey, they've, they've worked this shit out and we don't have to be the gatekeeper of that information. Go mm. find it. And there's other options too right now. Um, I know that like there's, there's betterhealth.com. apply for financial aid. I didn't think that I would get any and I did and I applied for it and I got financial aid because well, I'm a single dad too. So I think that might have had a factor, but I mean, there's, there's so many different options right now. And the other thing too is find people who are going through the same thing. When I was deconstructing, there weren't, I didn't know any podcasts yet. I mean, there was like ex evangelical. I did a quick Google search when I started. Um, but then just having a group of people that were deconstructing too, because the way that the podcast started was I, I had like, I just randomly had an idea. I'm like, I'm going through some weird shit. And I need somebody to talk to about it that like gets it. And I had like a few people in my mind that I'm like, Oh yeah, they've left too. Chuck was one of them. Jamie Lee Finch, uh, Prisca, she was on our season one. Look, a few people and I started, we just had like a messaging group on Facebook where we message each other. And I was like, hey, do you guys want to do this with me? And they're like, yeah. And then after that, it just became a thing of like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm deconstructing. Here's a weird thing I just came across. And they're like, oh shit, you know, oh, they don't type their, their support. And so just having that support and then that eventually turned into like, as you have like an on, like a secret Facebook group that kind of became our thing too. And it be able to have like a group of people that are going through the same thing. You're able to kind of like voice some of this stuff out, realize that you're not nuts. Um, Cause really you need empathy because you're strategically being shown zero empathy they want the, the way that those those environments are they're wanting you to go through your experience right now be like oh my god everybody left me i must be doing something wrong i need to change my that's what it's all conditioned you to do is to think that you're the one who's doing it wrong yeah, but the, the problem, problem is about this fellowship and the problem about shunning is it didn't take an effect that one day they're going to make fucking social media where all the people that have been disfellowshipped and shunned can start talking to each other and realize this is a big load of shit and if we can find empowerment by empathizing with each other and then figuring out ways to communicate this stuff so that what i look at what what i'm doing with my podcast and everything is i've left some weird things and i want to go back now and pave the way for the same people to, that are walking out of the same thing, they they have a way that they can go through. And if I can make it a little less bumpy for them, where they're not freaking out about, oh my God, am I going to go to hell? Or is my doctor wrong or whatever? If I can somehow create a way to help them see that they're going to be okay and that there's a way to go and that there are people waiting for them on the other side, um, I think that's going to make a load of difference for people. So my answer is how did I get through it? Therapy and empathy from other people going through the same thing. Um, but I, books too, Leaving the Fold was really helpful. Jimmy Lee Finch's book was really helpful. And, yeah, there's um, good resources out there. I was going to say, uh, I was talking to Daryl Ray recently from the Recovery mm, from Religion. I like him, yeah, yeah. As well as the Secular Therapy Project. So that's mm-hmm. a great resource for people who, uh, or you, you might not even have someone in your area, but they'll do Skype. Uh, consultation yeah. with you so someone could be in south africa and you could be in san francisco doesn't matter now as you say the mm-hmm. power of the internet and social yeah. media you can meet with someone across the world i mean i'm in great britain right now you're somewhere where are you coming from actually i forgot to ask you where you live st louis missouri just um the, the, the sh- we have no oceans we have nothing interesting <laughs> we just have yeah, mud rivers and riots yeah um, okay <laughs> 
yeah, sounds like a fun that. place. You're not selling it last. <laughs> I'm from not, not I'm, I'm stuck Lewis. here. I'm here for my son, you know. Other than yeah. that, I would be like You'd be where there's there a better so gay community. They're like, oh, I'm in the middle Lewis of like is not it, huh? No, no. I'm like no. the only like gay guy my age who is a dad, which is a weird circumstance anyway. There's just a lot of otherness in right. St. Yeah. Louis, yeah. but I but do kind of love it. Yeah. yeah. There's I'll always good to be found somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like you say, forming a new tribe. That's another thing. It's a huge thing. I mean, recently I was in Seattle. My sister Valerie and I, we drove up to Vancouver, BC. We had lunch Ooh, in a pub with so about 15 people, all of whom I've met through either the podcast or Twitter or I love it. Facebook. And mm-hmm. we sat in this pub and we're like blown away by the fact that we have all of this backstory in common. And yet here, most of these guys were from Canada. There was a couple Americans in there. Uh, the power of social media. It is amazing. So people definitely need to take advantage of the communities that are out there or form your own. Yeah. You might have to start that, a new tribe. That was kind of, that was kind of my strategy of like, I recognized I was missing something that I had before. I mean, I, I was a past, I was very involved in my church. We went out to eat every week and all this, and then to have that completely yeah, gone, uh, you have to find a new way to rebuild it. And there is a little bit, I'd like what you said too, about like finding out a line because it's kind of like when you start dating online, there's a little bit of a process that your mind has to go through and adapt to of like, okay, well, this is not the normal way, but we're going to try it. So trying to like kind of find a community online, it takes a little bit of dipping your feet into it. And then you may feel a little like weird or like, Oh my God, am I a loser now? Or am I as whatever? (laughs) But part of that is just having to move past that and realize that in 2019, the world is going to look different and you can use the tools that you are told you're supposed to have been using, which that rule came when there wasn't the tools that you have now, or you can have rules that are based on real life and what's in front of you and evolution and the progression that's there. And it has happened up to this point. So, yeah. Well, and they taught us critical thinking skills. I mean, I went to Bible college. I went to seminary. One of the things that's come back to bite them in the ass is the fact that they taught me how to think critically. <laughs> so yeah. everything that I do with Oops. my with my research, my writing, my podcast, that's how I pour my energy mm. and creativity and my kind of critical academic brain into helping people is these are all skills that I learned in Bible college and in mm-hmm. seminary. So how, how ironic is that? <laughs> yeah, mine was like back. pastorally, like caring for people. Yeah, and like it's the same thing. That's what I'm kind of doing yeah. in some weird ways. Like, I feel and very it, much so. I mean, I've talked to yeah. people. In fact, I'm going to be talking to Tim Sledge and David Hayward, the naked pastor. We're going to do a I podcast. Love David Hayward. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're going to do one with the three of us that we've all realized that we're all ex-pastors, mm-hmm. all deconstructed. And I've sent them a list of questions, uh, specific theological and biblical questions. And we're going to really take a deep dive into this stuff because we feel the same way, that we're still acting as pastors, as you say, even though we're not working in a church, we're not leading people to Jesus. Uh, we want to help people recover from trauma, which is kind of why I got into the game in the first place. I wanted to help people. I love that. Like one other thing that just hit me too was when you're mentioning these pastors, you know, we're kind of like some of us who came from evangelicalism, we're like programmed to look at these, like usually like white, white straight men, you know? And, and it's cool to see people like Tim and David, come back and be evolved enough to say yeah but not just us you know like here's the cool thing is like those people are able to say um we're not the only demographic to be looking at anymore but that doesn't disqualify them and say oh they don't have anything interesting to say because they hella do you know and i've noticed that like with myself when i was a fundamentalist it meant that we only looked the white straight men Mm -hmm. and then as i was leaving i read a book by Brene brown Oh, changed my life forever. And now it's like cool because I can get influenced by so many different demographics of people now Mm -hmm. in addition to what I had before. But now the ones who came out of the stuff that before, they're the ones that are like, 
fuck white straight men only. <laughs> like, you know, like we don't want this anymore. And so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see them kind of passing those reins too. And also kind of like helping other people find their voices, like what you're doing and promoting other people who are doing great work. Um, and oh my God, David Hayward's Naked Pastor comics. Yeah, There's brilliant. a few of them where I'm just like, this is more effective <laughs> yep. the Bible, and it's a comic. It's a yeah, comic. Just, like you say, it tells a story, especially yeah. more poignant if, like you and me, we've been there, so we get it mm. perhaps on a deeper level. Well, it. now, I've got to go eat dinner because they're cooking <laughs> food at our barbecue. Uh, <laughs> how can people contact you? What's the best way to get in touch? You're, you're, getting, you're getting more involved with Twitter, so what's your Twitter handle then? How can people follow you there? I, I like to just use my name for everything. Brady Harden, B R A D Y H R D I N. Um, that's me on Instagram, Twitter, and in the podcast, the Life After Podcast. You can find on any podcast app. And we have like a um, secret Facebook group because we don't want anybody to ever deconstruct alone again. Uh, mm -hmm. People should be deconstructing with friends. So deconstruct with friends. Uh, you can access that group. You, we have just like a couple of like entrance questions to make sure we don't get any weird trolls, trolls in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and message our, our Facebook group. We also have a Slack channel for that too, for people who aren't on Facebook because Facebook is not always the, the, the smartest <laughs> way to true, yeah. social media. So have gone off of it now. Oh, I've yeah. talked to people on Twitter that said, I'd like to look at your Facebook group, but I'm not on Facebook anymore. So, yeah, that's a problem. They're harvesting our data. So people are like, well, you know what? I'm going to get out of this thing. Yeah. Well, so cool. We Thank like to offer you. the Slack channel, too, for that same reason. But, um, yeah, that's where you can find us. And um, I love the stuff you're doing. And I really appreciate you letting me come on today and talk about it. Like, yeah, man. I absolutely had a great time. We definitely need to keep in touch. For sure. Well, um, maybe could circle back around and kind of, you know, maybe six months down the road, compare stories again and see what's that. changed. See if you're still in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. If I'm still here. No, I'm not going anywhere, man. This is the greatest place in the world to live. <laughs> we, here. we just yeah. had a huge rally. We had about 100 people last night. We played a two-hour set. It was absolutely amazing. So what, what instrument do you play? I play the drums. So we play in a rock and blues band. And then the second set got heavier and heavier and heavier. We ended up with some Nirvana, some Metallica in there. It was oh absolutely God. fantastic. So, yeah, we had the crowd up and dancing, and it was great, man. It's the best experience, you know. But that's part it. of my reconstruction, too, is getting back mm. into playing drums because I played in worship bands for years and years and years. And then when I quit the church, I quit all that. So getting mm. back into music, which is something that I love to do, has been a huge part of discovering, you know, that, that identity of who I was before all that. So time. I love it's it. What I'm saying it's not like a reset. It's more of like just an evolution of the things that we found valuable then mm. and finding that outside of the indoctrination and realizing, exactly. because think about this, like your, your talent and your passion for drums survived indoctrination. Yep. I think that's kind of a badass thing, right? That when we <laughs> find something that can survive an entire worldview shift, I think that's kind of where we are and that's who we are and like our deepest heart, you know? Well, and I think it's a metaphor for what we've been saying too, is that I learned how to play the drums originally to be in Christian metal bands, specifically to go out and play in clubs and pubs and bars as a Christian metal band. So I practiced, I learned how to play the drums. I was in Christian metal bands for about 10 years. Then I played in worship bands. So the whole context of learning to play the drums was all about, you know, being missional, as they, as they would say. Mm -hmm. but, I remember that word. <laughs> yeah. The fact that, like you said, I picked it back up, and now I play rock and blues mm -hmm. and metal has nothing to do with being missional. That's something that survived, as you say. And those I skills, love it. I actually learned them. So there's... There's a value in going through those experiences. Mm -hmm. You can take some good away from it. It's okay. not all bad, but yeah, there's a lot of trauma. So <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> That's how it always ends. Like, yeah, and there's a lot of trauma. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of trauma. <laughs> anyway, thanks, man. I've really My had pleasure. a great time chatting with you. We'll definitely come back around and do it again. Sounds great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you letting me all have right. fun. Thanks, all Brady. Right. I'll speak to you again, man. All right. Sounds good. Have a good one. You know, there was a lot of different show titles that I could have picked for this one episode, but one of the things that really stood out to me was what Brady said about 
this issue of suppressing his sexuality in order to fit in. And going back to the intro that my daughter Bri and I did at the beginning of the show, some of the things she said really kind of resonated too. This idea of having to provide re- covering for someone. It's amazing, isn't it? That And that's kind of what happened to Brady, isn't it? And how ironic is it that his now ex-wife has herself come out as gay and she's now engaged to a woman. And so in a way, maybe they were both seeking that religious cover for each other, even though they perhaps didn't know it at the time or at least acknowledge it. Who knows? But it's a fascinating thing to think about as he talks about this this indoctrination and control and the purity culture and all the things that fit into what evangelicalism tells us or told us, certainly in my case, and what I told people. I have to be honest, as a pastor, I was telling people a lot of the same things. So some of the stuff that Brady and I talked about hit a little too close to home. I hope it was impactful for you as well. Now, in two weeks, we're going to be coming out with an episode with Bill Prickett. He is another one, as I said at the beginning, he came out as gay, but he was part of conversion therapy, doubling down and trying to kind of really suppress his sexuality. He was actually a proponent of conversion therapy. That's how bad he got into it. But he's he's come out of that now. He is now the host, or I should say the co-host of the Recovering From Religion podcast. I made the connection through Daryl Ray, who was on the show a few months ago as part of the Recovering From Religion Foundation, as well as the Secular Therapy Project. So those are both fantastic resources. If you're in a position where you're struggling, you're needing some help, you can get a hold of those organizations. Now, coming up in the next few weeks, as we mentioned, we got Bill Prickett. I'm also in talks with Tim Sledge and David Hayward, the Naked Pastor. We're still working on setting up a day and a time to figure out when we can do our podcast recording with the three of us talking about deconstruction and all sorts of other wonderful things. I'm also in talks with Laura Anderson, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show. We had a really interesting discussion. She's a therapist who helps people with religious trauma syndrome as well as some other things. So we are going to be taking a very deep dive into the subject of trauma, PTSD, and then specifically religious trauma syndrome. Now, speaking of religious trauma syndrome, my very good Canadian friend Janice Selby has some really exciting news. She is going to be hosting the Court 2020, the C-O-R-T conference on religious trauma in 2020 in Vancouver. I think it's in April next year. If you are a supporter of Mindship Podcast, you can get a $60 discount for tickets for the Court 2020. So if you do that, that would be great. It helps me as well as helps Janice. And speaking of Janice, both her and Bethany Carter recently upped their Patreon uh, donations every month, which is a huge thing. I really appreciate that. If you're a supporter of this show on Patreon, not only do you get early access to episodes on Wednesday instead of having to wait till Friday, you also get to be a part of the Closed Mindship Podcast Facebook group. And we've been doing our monthly Zoom calls. Last month, we had a call with Claudine Gallagher, who was on the show a while ago, talking about post-Mormon mental health. We had a fantastic call with Claudine, and actually, we're going to be doing one in November with Laura Anderson, actually the one who's going to be on the show in a little while here. So that's going to be a fantastic conversation with Laura, talking about RTS. So lots of really cool features for being a Patreon supporter. All right, I don't want to keep you too long. Thanks for hanging out with myself and Brady and listening in to my daughter, Bree. I'm super excited to be talking to her, interviewing her for an upcoming podcast as well around this same issue of sexuality and evangelicalism and all the stuff that goes on in that. So stay tuned for next week's episode with Bill Prickett. Please let me know your thoughts, comments, and feedback on this episode with myself and Brady. If you want to leave a review on iTunes or Podbean, that would be great. That would be really helpful for the show. You can always leave me a comment a thought a tweet on twitter at mindshift 2018 follow me there get a hold of brady as well all right take care i'll see you in a couple of weeks with bill prickett i've been your host as always dr clint haycock right here on mindshift podcast 